Hello and welcome to the Green Voice podcast where you get all the dirt in sustainability in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I'm your host, Grant Irvin with s and USA, and today I have with me Taki Durakos from Pitt, Ohio Express. Uh, Taki, how are you doing? Uh, good afternoon, Grant. It's good, good to, to take see. a little time with you. Yeah, it's great to have you here. Um, we got a, a, I'm going to say an uncharacteristic sunny day here in Pittsburgh. We've had to pull the shades down in the uh, Center for Media Innovation here at Point Park to be able to get all the lighting right and everything, which is, uh, it, we should celebrate that, <laughs> I think. So, how have you been? Good, good. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to wind down the year, and we've been busy from a business standpoint, but it, it's nice to just take a little bit of time, take a pause in a busy schedule, and, and, and talk sustainability. Awesome. Well, we appreciate you, uh, you being here with us today and uh, kind of sharing some of the story about Pitt, Ohio. Um, I know that you guys have been really involved in a lot of the Pittsburgh Earth Day uh, activities over the years, and um, which is super exciting. And um, you know, one of the things that we wanted to do with you here in studio is take the opportunity to dive in a little bit about fleet and fleet electrification, and um, you know, some of the work that you guys are doing in that space, uh, where you're really leaders. Um, and so, you know, we're excited to kind of uh, kind of break into that a little bit with you today. Um, but one of the things maybe for the audience, just start, uh, start by talking a little bit about kind of your, yourself and your role at, at Pitt, Ohio. Yeah, sure. So I'm, um, I'm the Vice President of Maintenance at Pitt, Ohio. So uh, to simplify things, it, it really means that I, I lead a team of uh, technicians and professionals that support the fleet. So from uh, cradle to grave, from the time we purchase an asset to the time we retire it, uh, my team is involved in the specifications and the purchase of the equipment mm -hmm. and then um, supporting it and maintaining it through its life. That's exciting. <laughs> now, you know, maybe take a step back actually, like uh, most folks, and I'm guilty of this just being a, a Pittsburgher myself and knowing the Pitt, Ohio name and brand and kind of the, the work that you guys do, um, maybe talk a little bit about kind of the industry and logistics and, you know, how you kind of serve, serve the public here. Yeah, so, uh, so Pitt, Ohio, um, family owned, uh, been a stalwart or a, or a cornerstone of uh, the city of Pittsburgh. Started uh, 44 years ago moving freight between Pittsburgh and Ohio. Makes sense. And uh, gave a great name, right? <laughs> expanded into uh, a number of states. Today we service uh, 14 states and we're part of a larger organization, the Pitt, Ohio Transportation Group that is a collection of five less than truck load companies. Mm -hmm. so, um, so what does that mean? It, it really means that uh, we're moving freight for a number of customers. Um, when you see one of our trucks or our tractor trailers, it could be a, a, a one customer's a, a load of, uh, of goods and materials, or it could be many different customers that are in there. And if you were to come visit one of our sites and walk the dock, you would see uh, a wide variety of products that we move within our, our, our freight network. That's awesome. So we do the, the asset-based uh, movements, mm -hmm. but we also have a supply chain group that they'll work with outside providers to move freight as well. It's interesting, you know, logistics and supply chain are words that you've heard a lot in the news lately, um, you know, over the last couple of years in part because of the pandemic and um, kind of the residual impacts of that. What, what has that meant for the industry um, in terms of moving freight and some of those, those challenges, but also I'm sure it's given some opportunities as well. Yeah, I think, uh, I think there's been uh, significant challenges the last couple of years. Um, you know, one, like everybody else, when COVID struck, I think we were, uh, we were unsure what did it mean. Uh, you know, I can tell you stories of ordering uh, thousands of bandanas and <laughs> Uh, worrying about masks and hand sanitizer in all of the trucks. But, you know, we got through that and pivoted mainly because of our people. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, very good in terms of wanting to support the organization and the customer base and, uh, and, and definite a team that pulled together to support it. I think over the last uh, couple of years, really challenging in terms of um, keeping the fleet moving. I'm the VP of maintenance and my job is to make sure that our Things our are, folks yeah. are maintaining the equipment and they're up and operational and you know parts have been a challenge. Um, 
cycling in new equipment has mm -hmm. been a challenge. So, you know, over the course of the last three years, we've gotten a little bit older on the fleet side. Mm. Um, in terms having, of equipment's age? Yeah, in yeah. terms of equipment's age, uh, having an internal group of um, technicians has helped quite a bit. Um, you know, you can stretch that life cycle. Mm -hmm. um, you can take on some larger repairs that maybe you don't wouldn't normally do. Yeah. Um, but you can only do that to some uh, so much. So I think right now we're in the process of playing catch up. Um, we're starting to get a lot of new equipment coming in and looking forward to leveraging the new technology and also putting our people in into some newer newer equipment that's, trucks tractors trailers that's exciting yeah um you know your your, your journey in sustainability is as pit ohio um talk about the the origins of that and you know how you guys have evolved because when i first came in, in contact with you guys um it was probably around the the harmer the development of the harmer mm -hmm. microgrid uh, project, which I want to get into a little bit, but your work in there kind of started before that. Um, can you talk a little bit about your journey as a company and, and what that has meant for you personally? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, maybe part of it is, you know, our, the monic the, 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 the brand, the recognition on the side of our trailers that says we're, we're always there for you. Mm -hmm. It starts with our people. Um, we're in a number of different communities um, throughout the Midwest and Mid-Atlantic, and we've I think always felt that it's been important to be good stewards in the communities mm -hmm. that we're in. Um, from a sustainability standpoint, everything that we are seeing today and doing has been a, a building of smaller projects over mm -hmm. time. So, so I think cumulative. about it's cumulative. I think about 10 years, a little more than 10 years ago, we started a sustainability steering committee. Mm -hmm. um, that's uh, that is a team that that meets quarterly and um, they are comprised of um, all of the different departments within the organization. Mm -hmm. um, so we're looking at a number of things regularly in terms of what can we do better, what can we improve, where can we have a positive impact. And then from a, a, a leadership perspective, um, Chuck Hamill, the owner and president of mm -hmm. our organization, has always been focused on um, sustainability. So a little bit before the Harmer project, mm -hmm. we started with a, a, a large solar project out in East Windsor. Um, from there, we, um, through a partnership with the University of Pittsburgh mm -hmm. and Ron Godovic and yeah. Winstack started dabbling in microgrids. Mm -hmm. uh, about the same time, we started working on electric forklifts and uh, one thing kind of led to the other. Mm -hmm. So, you know, today we have this uh, vision looking, looking outward, looking to the future saying, hey, you know, uh, resources are not unlimited. Mm -hmm. um, we have to be conscious of what we're using and how much of it we're using. And we're trying to become more efficient at what we do. And a lot of the work started on the, on the facility side mm. because that's where it um, made the most sense. In terms um, of energy efficiency. In terms of energy efficiency, in mm -hmm. terms of um, low flow urinals and water usage mm -hmm. and um, heating and cooling, all of the above, um, it's squarely rested in, in our facilities. And today we have a number of LEED certified facilities um, because of that. And about four years ago, four and a half years ago, um, we started to look at the fleet and okay. the fleet created some, some other dynamics and okay. other challenges. And, um, you know, we were talking a little bit earlier, um, we primarily run um, class A tractor trailers. Mm -hmm. And then we have larger box trucks. So What's class A for folks who benefit here? So if, if you're going down the highway and you see a, an 18 wheeler, okay. that would be a that would be a class eight. <coughs> so we're talking big trucks. Big trucks. Yep. And then we have we have some smaller trucks. They're the box trucks, but they are the the larger variety box trucks. So they're they're typically they've got a 28 foot body with a lift gate mm -hmm. on them and. Um, Pretty pretty large. I call them like a, a rolling aircraft carrier okay. in terms of uh, the amount of freight that we can put on there. But with those units um, and and pivoting towards the fleet now, it's created some other dynamics in terms of sustainability, mm. in terms of direction of where we're headed with the fleet. Um, there's a lot of regulatory pressure out there today in terms of internal combustion engines yeah. and emissions, and um, wanting to clean up the air. That's amazing. 
What's the, you know, like we, we talked a little bit about Harmer, but let's talk about the genesis of that. Like, so you have your committee together. Uh -huh. um, effectively, a lot of ideas probably start to get uh, tossed uh -huh. around. You're, you're looking at data, facilities data. What, what was the, the germination point for, for Harmer? And maybe talk about what happens at Harmer too, I think. Yeah, so, so, so um, from a germination standpoint, I, I was not here, but from what I, what I know. Uh, the Lord know, it, it was, Yeah, yeah our, our headquarters is in the Strip District. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it, it kind of happened by chance over lunch. Um, uh, Jim Fields, my boss, the Chief Operating Officer mm -hmm. up at Ohio, and Jim Mogg, who is our Director of Facilities, were heading out to lunch and they happened to walk by uh, uh, Winstack <laughs> And, uh, and it caught their attention, and, okay. and that really uh, led to a conversation with Ron and uh, Professor Reed at the University mm -hmm. of Pittsburgh, and it, and it developed from there. And uh, what we did in Harmer, we had, a, we had put together a small microgrid. It was, uh, it's a facility that we had relocated out of the Strip mm -hmm. um, for many years. Our, our terminal, along with our headquarters, were co-located there that was the in the Strip District. That was to help the operation in terms of uh, entrance to like the turnpike and access? Uh, some access and I, I could not imagine having a trucking terminal in the <laughs> middle of all that activity today. It would have been really challenging. Space. You needed space. Safe, space and safety. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we relocated nine years ago now and uh, part of that relocation in, included a, a small solar project and a wind project uh, with a, a very small microgrid mm -hmm. and it was really to validate uh, what the conversations and the dialogue with uh, with uh, Ron Godovic and Professor Reed um, it was you know it was putting that into um, application and mm -hmm. and validating that it made sense and skip forward um, six years so three years ago uh, we commissioned our uh, new facility in Parma mm. which is um, suburbs of Cleveland Ohio yeah. and that terminal you know, all of the learnings that we took from Harmer, we incorporated into uh, that terminal. So, so there we have geothermal heating and cooling. Wow. We have solar, we have wind, we have a megawatt of on-site battery storage from a okay. microgrid standpoint. And then from a fleet perspective, that's really where we started to um, electrify some of, the, some of the fleet units, mm. more to understand how how will it work in our operation? Yeah. How well does it work? What are some of the things we need to consider so that as we move forward, we can uh, have a good understanding and we can scale up? That's interesting. And so that, that Parma project basically learned from all the, the, the practices, the hiccups, whatever, that happened in, in here in Harmerville. Um, and then are you looking at more terminals or uh, new additional terminals that take on those same types of energy practices? I think we're always looking at that. Um, we're, we're looking ahead. I mean, today we're probably doing more refreshes of existing terminals. And mm -hmm. I can't say that we've, we've necessarily said we're going to commit to doing something on the size and scale of Parma. Mm -hmm. Parma is a 130-door facility, so okay. it's one of the larger facilities. And we had the, we had the flexibility to design it from scratch. So mm -hmm. this was a, 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 a build from the ground up. Um, and, you know, as when you're working with a, a blank slate, yeah. um, you have a lot more flexibility. When you're working with maybe an existing structure that you're refreshing or doing some things, um, there's not some necessarily as easy. Yes. that exist in there for sure. So, so uh, maybe to pivot then to kind of the fleet conversation. So it, was it Parma that was kind of that initiation into thinking about what fleet transition looks like or what was your starting point there? So I, I think when, when I came to Pitt, Ohio, Jim Fields, um, he had really had a, a vision and looked out and saw um, that the development or the evolution of um, battery electric and medium duty, heavy duty space were coming. We had done a little bit of work with mm -hmm. uh, CNG units. Okay. So I, I think you're gas. familiar, compressed natural gas. So. We had a, a small natural gas fleet there in, in Harmer, um, but really we're looking for what's next or where we had it. Mm -hmm. And when you really talk to industry leaders, when you talk to manufacturers, there was 
a lot of conversation of, you know, this is where we're going to migrate and move to. So um, we started a dabble. We actually uh, rented a smaller, um, we'll call it like a last mile delivery vehicle that was electric and operated with one of our sister companies, U.S. Cargo, locally here in Pittsburgh. Okay. And it gave us an understanding of um, the characteristics of a battery electric truck. So how does it perform? What are the better duty cycles? What does cold do to it? Mm. Um, how do hills impact uh, range and, yeah. and all of that? So. You know, after a little bit of work in that space um, and some involvement or engagement in um, some of the electric vehicle councils that are out there, um, we found ourselves partnering with Volvo. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we're a large uh, Mac fleet. We're a large uh, supplier of um, uh, transportation to the Volvo Mac group okay. internally. So. So well, you already work with we them. We already work they're, with them. They're customers yeah. as well as your clients. Like they're both. Okay. Yeah, there's a there's a tight relationship. So it actually opened up the door to um, to have some dialogue very early to validate the that what we were going to try and do would make sense. Um, and we started to do that analysis in terms of looking at duty cycles, mm -hmm. in terms of looking where would we want to put this unit, how does the support look like. You know, what's the ecosystem built around it to make sure it's successful both for Pitt, Ohio and Volvo? I mean, even though it was, you know, it was a, a early toe in the water, um, you still want it to be successful yeah. and to, um, to allow you to get off the ground without challenges or problems. A couple of questions inside of there. Like, what was the, um, how did you make the case, um, both in terms of uh, drivers and operators, but also in terms of, upper level management? Like what's that conversation like from the operation side, both up and down kind of the ladder? Well, I, I think it was an education. So I think it was, you know, as we were having the conversations with Volvo, um, it was, there was also internal dialogue going on in terms of, you know, here are the, the vehicles that mm -hmm. are available. Here are the, here's the range, here's the payload. Um, Here's what we think might make sense and might work. And we started to dig into um, duty cycles and routes. Um, mm -hmm. Like we're, So we had to do the homework. Sense. Yeah, yeah. You didn't like, you know, to put these trucks in a, in a route where maybe you're just doing long stem miles and highway speeds and not a urban drive cycle, urban environment, mm -hmm. uh, would not necessarily be the best mm -hmm. um, application for the technology or the units. So, because of starting and stopping or? Yeah, in the electric space, uh, about 25% of the energy that we're using in these vehicles, it's from regenerative braking. So, okay. um, you know, traffic is actually, while it may not be good for efficiency in a, in a trucking company, it's it's <laughs> it's good for um, battery range, vehicle okay. range in a in a battery electric vehicle. So, so we did a lot of that homework, and then um, and then it was walking through timing. Uh, as you know, I mean you've you've got to work through the whole um, uh, integration of uh, charging. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we're not talking plugging into a, a, a wall, wall outlet or. Yeah. A, or a, or a dryer or washing machine um, circuit. You're, um, what, what we put in in Cleveland, they were 75 kilowatt DC fast chargers. Mm -hmm. At the time they were pretty high speed and very fast. And you know, three years now, three years later, they're, they feel like dinosaurs, wow. but, that, but that's an evolution. Yeah. It kind of shows the story of how fast the technology is moving. Mm -hmm. So both on the trucks and the hardware to charge the trucks, um, it's its all evolving very quickly. What's whats that relationship look like with uh, an OEM, you know, with a, with a manufacturer like a Volvo or a Mac? Is it, is it consultative? Like, are they trying to find their space in this, in this industry as well? Or um, what's that, that kind of conversation look like? I, I think you're right. I think it is a little bit of that. I think they're trying to find the space. Um, obviously, when you get to that point, you've done a lot of uh, analysis and you've already started to kind of understand the market and, mm -hmm. and what makes sense. But I think it's a, it's a validation. And then I think it's, it's, there's a partnership. So, um, you know, why did, we, why did we go down this path with Volvo? And um, it, it was really, we, we, we do so much on the conventional side mm -hmm. 
on the internal combustion side that there's already a strong relationship between the mm -hmm. organizations and um, support um, was there from day one. So, so I think you know while these units um, were fairly new, I think when we put our two units in Cleveland, they were the 29th and 30th um, trucks built, and the majority of the others were in California. The, from as, their production line. Yeah, from yeah. their production okay, line. Okay, wow. Yeah, so it was it was generation one, very early. Um, you know, lots of visibility and lots of eyes on these vehicles mm -hmm. and, and, and wanting it to be successful. But I, I think because of the relationship, it allowed for uh, regular check-ins. Um, I mean, it was, it was fairly flawless. I would say there were just some delays in getting the units, but when we initially started down the path, we were worried we weren't gonna have the charging and infrastructure in in time. Mm -hmm. um, that took about a year. And then it was it was about six months later that we got the vehicles in. So from a timing standpoint, it all worked out. And I think we went into it uh, assuming that um, it's very early. We're going to just kind of walk through mm -hmm. it. And um, there may be some hurdles that come up. And collectively, as a group, we'll, we'll work through we'll it. Work through it. Yeah. What, is that a chicken and the egg scenario in terms of, like, do you have the infrastructure and the charging first, or do you have the vehicles like to match kind of the specs, like is that a, an iterative dialogue between the two or how does that operate? Uh, I think when we started, chargers were way out there. Okay. Um, they were front, at like. least a year in terms of lead time. Um, the vehicles seemed like they were a little bit near, but I, I would say today, looking at what's going on, I, I think probably the most critical piece is not the hardware for chargers or the vehicles. It's, it's probably just making sure you have power wow. to support the vehicles. So it's so understanding. So working with the utility then and oh, having absolutely. that information. Yeah, I think, I think utility, uh, utilities will become fleet's uh, best friends um, because I think there's a lot of integration, a lot of planning that has to happen. Yeah. And the, the reason I say it um, you know, it, it's one thing to support uh, an electric car, mm -hmm. um, but the, like our box trucks, uh, with with uh, the size of the batteries and the energy they're using, each truck uses about the equivalent of four houses of energy a year. One truck um, equals four houses. Yeah, one box right. truck. Okay. So if we were running tractor trailers, we'd probably be more in the range of 13 to 15 houses of, of energy consumption a year. So. Many of our terminals, our depots, they are um, fairly sizable in terms of power units. Uh, I was just in Cleveland mm -hmm. yesterday, and there we have uh, about 80 power units. 25 of them are box trucks, and mm -hmm. the others are tractor trailers. So, as you, you know, if you were going to electrify a, a large portion of your fleet, mm -hmm. you're talking about putting in a new subdivision. So, More is the there power. enough of power? So is there enough power to support that? What's that look like, so, like since you guys did a, a microgrid or a nanogrid in, in Parma, like uh, are you pulling additional power then from the utility or is that grid that you created enough to support those electric vehicles or? Good question. Yeah. Um, the grid that we have there today, um, you know, what we did, it was, it was designed really to support the facility and it, and it does that. I mean, mm -hmm. we can essentially operate uh, off the grid, we're generating enough power to do that. But as we add in um, the fleet mm -hmm. into the mix, um, that changes the balance. That's like we would, the power components. it would, it would add a like if we were going to electrify all of the fleet there, it would add a significant of of, of power that would be needed. And we would have to upsize um, probably transformers mm. and lines and. Um, you know, as well as maybe add uh, a lot more renewables to, to support the fleet. So. so do you start to have those conversations now with a utility or like is that given kind of your, your expansion plans and opportunities? What does that look like? Yeah, that's a good question. So I would say the, the, the best approach, what we have started to do um, is, is really reach out to utility partners. Um, we've looked at our sites. Um, mm -hmm. Um, our operations team has developed a tool where we can see um, miles run and payload and get an understanding of the local fleets. And, okay. and they vary by market. So, you know, uh, um, some of our terminals are more rural areas and they're running more miles and mm -hmm. less 
start and stop. Yep. And then there are other facilities that, you know, they may be on the outskirts of Philadelphia or in Baltimore, and you're more in that urban drive cycle. So we we started by looking at, you know, where does it make the most sense? Where does it fit the technology? Mm -hmm. And then it was, um, you know, what kind of what kind of power do we need in prioritizing? So those conversations can take a while. Um, first, you know, every, every utility is a little bit different. Some sure. have electrification teams. You know, I think locally, Duquesne, yeah, Duquesne Light's Light a good example a of that. Yep. Um, uh, but not everybody does. So finding the right um, contact within the organization mm -hmm. is important. And then understanding um, what their process is to, to request more power. Because I guess to get this right too, like you're, in some cases you're gonna go from a, a certain level of electrical power consumption, mm -hmm. but you're almost gonna start to transition into, I'm gonna call it like an industrial use, right? Like yep. uh, much like you might see in a foundry or a factory or something where that, that power pool is gonna go well beyond what a traditional logistics hub might be. Oh, absolutely. So if, if you think about chargers, we talked about our, our 75 kilowatt chargers. Um, you know, today, uh, back then the trucks were charging at a max 150 kilowatts. Mm -hmm. um, today there are 250 kilowatt um, charging capabilities out there. Batteries are um, getting bigger. Um, the charging hardware, um, you know, I've seen 180 kilowatt fast charging. I've seen 250 kilowatt fast mm -hmm. charging. The Tesla semis that are, were participating in the NACV run on less, they use mm -hmm. 750 kilowatt chargers. So, you know, if you start to kilowatts. stack, if you start to stack a number of those chargers and you're looking at, hey, what's my, what's my regular load and I'm gonna add these battery electric vehicles in, mm -hmm. um, it really starts to change your, um, your profile in terms of the power you need on site. So. Like I said earlier, those can take time. I yeah. mean, you could you could be talking about two to three years in terms of lead time to um, to set that project up, even to get that project. Well, to to set it up, not that long, but to get it done, it could take two to three years right. to to do an upgrade. What's um, you know, kind of two pieces, I guess. On one side, what's this mean for your customer? And then uh, we I asked a little earlier, one to follow back up, like the driver and maybe start there, like the user, the operator experience. What are the folks finding when they're, they're driving these electric trucks? Uh, the, the drivers have absolutely appreciated it. I mean, you drive an electric yeah, car, yeah. so it's got a lot of get up and go. Yep. Um, a lot of technology. Um, from a driver perspective, you gotta remember like, you know, a diesel truck, you're at the pump, you're pumping diesel. There, there could be a little bit of uh, that smell, you have mm -hmm. exhaust. Um, much cleaner from from that standpoint, mm -hmm. and then much quieter. Yeah. Uh, compared no to a noise. conventional unit, so I, th I think I think some of what happens is with an electric, you start to hear all the other noises that you never <laughs> heard. So so initially somebody might think, hey, I have a problem, but it really isn't. It's right. just the noise that was was masked by that internal combustion engine. So. It's been very positive. Um, the drivers that we've had operating our battery electric trucks in Cleveland, they were, they were veterans of the organization. Mm -hmm. um, they had certain routes within the Cleveland metro area that they delivered to. And um, we actually outfitted them with some trifold brochures that if they were stopped and asked whether it was people <laughs> on the streets or whether it was customers, um, by all means, they had the ability to talk about the vehicles okay. and their experience but they could also give them a, a leave oh, behind. Oh, interesting. Um, that somebody could get educated on the trucks That's and understand right. what's going on. So. Because they were wondering, like, I don't hear the truck, I don't yeah. smell the truck, but there's this, clearly a truck right in front of me, yeah. right? Like, yeah. that's interesting. So really, really positive. And then you had asked about customers. Yeah. So I, I think it's becoming more and more a, a, a question and a conversation as we get bids for uh, new business, mm. uh, as we, um, have meetings to talk about um, uh, updates with current customers. There's a lot of questions that come back in mm -hmm. terms of supply chain, in terms of um, emissions, in terms of where are we headed, what are we doing. So, um, you know, we actually had a couple customer summits this past summer where we brought our, um, 
brought a number of our customers in uh, Cleveland. Okay. And it was a little bit of a show and tell, but it was also a tell us what you're looking for mm. from a supply chain in the future. So I think that was well received in, on both sides. Do you see a lot of those customers also kind of tracking sustainability data and, um, you know, or I imagine your customers are kind of across the spectrum. Um, but does that look any different between like say larger customers or smaller customers that are concerned about sustainability and, and kind of interested to see what Pitt Ohio is doing? Yeah, I, I think it varies. I think it's um, customers are very diverse, uh, exactly what you said. And there are some that are uh, very much looking ahead and looking to the future with mm -hmm. uh, understanding that, you know, pretty soon my, my whole supply chain is going to be under scrutiny and, and maybe we've committed, you know, some of the larger organizations have committed to being net zero or mm -hmm. um, to meet certain uh, carbon carbon targets. targets. Yeah. yeah. So so I think, um, I, I don't know that I would necessarily say it's the larger um, solely, but I, I think some of the larger ones are, are very active, but I think it's, um, just depends. I mean, we have some customers that the ownership is more attuned to sustainability, and um, you know, as as much as they're driving change within their organizations, they want to know what their partners yeah. are doing to to drive change in the value chain. We've seen that a lot too, just in supplier agreements, just you know, in our business at S and B with uh, in the construction and infrastructure space, you know, where customers are starting to ask and you know softly and quietly mm -hmm. and uh, more out of curiosity I think because a lot of folks are in this similar space of their journey which is relatively nascent you know they've they've done a project they might have done a charging project or something with waste elimination or mm -hmm. solar on a building you know um, and now they're starting to ask those like next generation questions um, which is pretty exciting I think it's really exciting. I, I think because it it's it helps move it helps move the needle. Mm -hmm. And when you have a lot of a lot of support and you have a lot of energy and you have a lot of resources that are working towards improving or mm -hmm. figuring something out, um, it can overcome some hurdles and obstacles that might be out there. Yeah, you know, one of the other things I wanted to ask you, um, just as we're we're coming up on time, is. Um, Two things, I guess. One is, you know, how are you all thinking about the resources that are out there through new programs like the Inflation Reduction Act and uh, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act? A lot of this, you know, work that the federal government and the Biden administration has done over the past couple of years. How does that factor into kind of your your fleet transition and you know some of the things that you might have on the uh, you know on, on the to do list? I, I think it helps. I, th I think the the funding, the investment that's out there, it's 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 going to help move the needle. I mean, uh, you know, when you look at a lot of what's out there with uh, the Nevi funding, uh, mm -hmm. you've got charging going in every fifty miles. You've that's got the National Electric Vehicle Initiative. Yes, yeah. you've got you've got corridor charging to help help improve that. Um, ability to, mm -hmm. to leverage uh, resources to do some of this. Um, the the technology is expensive right now. It's relatively early. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, being able to leverage um, some of the, the funding as an early adopter um, helps smooth out some of those mm -hmm. hurdles and challenges that come. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. So, you know, we're in the midst of a technician <coughs> shortage, uh, just on on internal combustion equipment on your conventional cars yeah. and and trucks, I think um, there's a level of complexity comes with a, an all electric um, medium duty box truck or a heavy duty tractor. So, right. um, I think so you that know workforce development the workforce component. development is important. We're 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 doing some work with. Uh, uh, Votech programs in the area within our footprint. We've started to do um, co-op programs mm -hmm. where we've got high school students that come in and they work side by side. Oh, that's great. With a mentor in our shops, and that's helping bring those folks along. And then we're trying to do some work to improve the equipment that that some of these programs work with. So over the last 20 years, there's probably been less investment in those mm -hmm. Votech programs. So. They're in need, whether it's uh, newer equipment yeah. to work on electronics um, or 
help in terms of identifying what's the tooling that's needed mm -hmm. to, to help people get comfortable. There's, there's a lot there. How much within that workforce component is like getting the, the workforce ready for this? Like, you know, a lot of stuff that we've talked about is not just <clears throat> the physical infrastructure, but it's data heavy, right? It's very data heavy. Um, what are some of those skills that, you know, kids that are coming through the education pipeline need to gain to get into those roles? Um, I, you know, some of it, some, <laughs> some of it, I would say it's, it's timing, right? I think we're in the midst of a, a big uh, sweeping change and, and, and you get caught up in it whether you want to or not. Yeah. Um, some of it's having a, a, an attitude of, you know, I need, as long as I'm a, a lifelong learner and I'm open to change, I, I can evolve and, and move as, as, as everything is is rapidly changing because I, I think if you have a, a fixed mindset it's moving too fast and it and it and it creates some challenges I mean I have a pretty diverse workforce mm -hmm. in terms of uh, age demographics and um, you know I have I have uh, young adults that uh, young technicians that would uh, rather can continue to work on uh, basic diesel truck okay and and then I have older folks that they're excited about the technology and they want to take on the challenge oh, that's and there's a and it's a mix so I think you know what we how we approach it there's enough work right now for everyone and mm -hmm. we have the conventional work that's still going to be there I mean we're still going to have to change tires we're still going to have to do some brake work we're yeah. still going to have to do body work and and these other components but then there is that a data piece. So the the folks that can um, leverage data that can um, filter it to where it's usable, right? Mm -hmm. So um, of all of the fault codes and diagnostics yeah. that are coming in, what is important? What's actionable? Um, what's meaningful that will keep the fleet rolling and um, keep re repair costs down? I think th those are important. So I, I think I think it's gonna continue to evolve but having an open mind and being willing to kind of step forward and 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 take something on that's a little bit new um i think are the the, the, the keys to success in the future awesome. that's a good idea um being flexible you know uh final question for you because we're this is our last uh show of the, of the year i'd be remiss to ask you what what's coming up ahead for you in 2024 and what are some of the things that are on your docket that you're excited to tackle? Oh, uh, sure. Well, I mean, I, I think related to what we're talking about, I think it's uh, continuing to um, uh, uh, work with utility partners. I mean, today we're really looking to uh, the future and to increase some of our power at sites. Uh, we're in the middle of refreshing the fleet. Mm -hmm. um, we're expanding our co-op programs that are out there because we've seen success and feel that they're very valuable. Yeah. And, um, and then I think keeping a pulse to um, what, what is next. So, I mean, recently we were, I think there was an announcement, you know, sitting here in Pittsburgh, we're kind of in the middle of three of the, the, the hydrogen, yeah. uh, hydrogen hub hubs. awards. So, you know, what, is, what does that mean for the future? So mm -hmm. does, that, does that incorporate um, fuel cell technology into our fleet. Um, how do we leverage um, um, the uh, the changes that are coming within the um, the region? That's awesome! Yeah. Exciting stuff up ahead. Yeah, very exciting. <laughs> well, Taki, thanks for being with us here today on the Green Boy podcast. We appreciate it um, and shedding some insights in the great work that you're doing at Pitt Ohio Express. Thanks so much, Grant. Hope you have a wonderful holiday. Thanks. You do the same. Thank you for listening in to the Green Voice podcast. Um, I'm Grant Irvin here with SMB USA, and thanks to our guest, uh, Taki Jarakos from Pitt, Ohio. So keep listening in, and we'll talk to you soon. Take care.